Praise the Lord, everybody. Please govern yourselves for the announcements. If you have a birthday or wedding anniversary in the month of March, we salute and celebrate you. May God bless you to see many more. We are pleased to announce that Berea is now open for in-person worship for Biblical Life Principles and Sunday morning service. Both services can still be viewed via Facebook Live and YouTube. We are now streaming on Berea's new Facebook page, which is Berea Family Tabernacle of Faith. Please search for the page with the burgundy and white logo profile picture. If you're watching via Facebook, please hit like, share, and comment. We would love to hear from you to know that you're being blessed by the message. If you're watching via YouTube, please hit the subscribe button and leave a comment as we would love to hear from you as well. Hit the bell so you'll be notified when the program is uploaded and don't forget to share it. Thank you. Attention parents, if you would like your child or children to be involved in the Easter program for Sunday, April 17th, 2022, please see Minister Kimonika Matthews, Dr. Dara Rutley, or call the church office to leave a voicemail. Save the date. Saturday, August 6, 2022 will be our annual church barbecue. More details to come. Our monthly sisterhood Zoom meeting is every second Saturday at 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Sisterhood is a circle of support where we enrich each other's lives through Christ and the Word of God regarding women's common concerns. For any questions regarding sisterhood, please see Dr. Dara Rutley. You're invited to Berea's Zoom prayer meeting, which takes place every Wednesday from 6 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Berea Family Tabernacle of Faith presents a Hand Up Men's Ministry, which takes place on March 26th of 2022 at 4 p.m. on Zoom. The Zoom meeting ID for Sisterhood Prayer and Men's Ministry is 228-592-592. 3235. And the passcode is God Will. That's one word, capital G O D, capital W I L L. The year end statements have gone out. If you have not requested yours, please email us at experienceberea at gmail.com or call the church office at 248 338 4748. We would like to thank all the financial supporters. Continue to use Givelify on the church website at experienceberea.org. If you don't feel comfortable making your charitable contribution electronically, you can mail it to Berea Family Tabernacle of Faith, 68 West Walton Boulevard, Pontiac, Michigan, 48340. If you or someone you know is sick and shut in, please contact the church office at 248-338-4748 or email us at experienceberea at gmail.com and we will have your name added to the sick and shut in prayer list on Berea's website. We don't want anyone to be overlooked. You can visit the church website for all announcements at experienceberea.org. Let's pray for all those that are sick and shut in or suffering in any type of way. This concludes our announcement. Thank you. Praise the Lord, saints. You know, there are some things we take for granted. I, I, was, I was thinking and feeling and wanting, you know, the emotions of being in the house of the Lord one more time. You know, for years, I think we took that saying for granted, that it was kind of like a salutation where you say, it's just good to be in the house of the Lord one more time. But these last couple of years with the pandemic, the ups, the downs, the shutdowns of churches, the different things, being in the house of the Lord just one more time means truly a joyous moment because you really don't know if you're actually going to be in the house of the Lord one more time. So I just got to be grateful and thankful because God allowed us one more time. God is good. He's great. He's merciful. 
and he allowed me to be here today. I want to give thanks to Bishop Roselle Rutley, Dr. Darfield Rutley, for allowing me to come before you this evening. You know, all the ministers and elders and all of the children of God. I thank the Lord for you. And I thank God for my beautiful wife, Minister Serena Bugs, because without her, there truly wouldn't be a me. We are truly one. Been together so long, I don't know what life is without her. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you for allowing us another day of life, health, and strength. For bringing us forth and allowing us to stand before your people, Lord, and bring forth your message. Lord, I come thanking you in advance for all that you have done, all that you will do, and all that you're doing through me. I ask right now in the name of Jesus that I decrease and you increase within me, allowing me to go forth to let your word flow. Let your people hear that which the Lord has set forth to give, to lead, deliver, prosper, edify, uplift, glorify. We give all honor and glory to you. This and all blessings we pray in the one and only name of Jesus. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. Woo, trying to stay restrained just a little bit there, and actually, you know, we, we, we're going to let the Lord do his work always, always. Go with me to Malachi, the third chapter. And I know most of the time when people go to Malachi, the third chapter, we're going to get it. This is generally used for tithes and offerings, and people all, people feel like, that means the minister going to beat you over the head for not giving. But that's not where the Lord's taking us tonight. Malachi, the third chapter, beginning at the first verse, it says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide in the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi. And purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be, be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, and as in former years. And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be swift, witness against a swift witness against sorcerers and against adulterers and against false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fa fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger for his right and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. Let us shoot to Malachi 4 and 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And ye shall tread upon the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servants, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all of Israel, with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great day and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. I have read to you Malachi 
chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, and Malachi chapter 4. I'm going to pin for you a title this evening that says, Will You Be Ready for His Return? It is astonishing how this passage of Scripture, Malachi 3 and 1, actually is considered to be referring to Jesus and it's referring specifically to his messenger, John the Baptist. The interesting thing about what was going on at the time that this passage of scripture was penned, uh, let me give you a small synopsis of, of what was happening. In, in Israel, there had been a neglect of the divine ordinances of God. And no divine law has ever been given that was not essential to human well-being. A neglect of divine standards is consequently a sin against oneself. Oftentimes, we think when we're sinning that we're sinning just against God, that we're doing God a disservice. But oftentimes, it's not God who's the one that's suffering. We are. A commentary wrote that there is not a Bible precept that is unreasonable. And therefore, it is unreasonable to give no heed to what is written. In this respect, the suffering of Israel was self-imposed. Now, it's interesting how somebody say, well, what does that have to do with us? This was talking about Israel. We were, this is still the Old Testament. They're talking about the coming of the Lord. Well, the interesting thing is, is that we're basically the new Israel. And we're suffering and going through things in the same way that the old Israel did. Because we are not heeding to his word. We're neglecting his word. We're doing what we perceive to be a good thing. There was also a commentary, a part two, where he said that there was a decay of the spiritual life. It is hardly possible to realize the depth of weakness portrayed by the prophet. As I said, I fully believe that Preachers and teachers today do Malachi kind of a disservice because the only time we talk about it, as I stated when I was opening, was when we want to get on people about tithes and offering. Will a man rob God? You know, we want to talk to you. Bring the offering in my house so there will be me in my house. And why? We want to beat the people up. But we fail to understand the totality of what was going on. There was a reason why the people weren't bringing the tithes and offering into the house. Very rarely do we hit on that part. Just like today. If you're not going to church, you ain't taking no money to church. I can sit here and talk about what people aren't doing all day long, but if they aren't in, in church, what is it going to matter? See, what people fail to understand is that your failure doesn't start because you're not paying your tithes and offering. Your failure starts because you're not serving God. Malachi was pointing out that basically Israel was basically doing their thing. They had pretty much abandoned God. He was secondary. They were, and what's sad, what's sad, one of the reasons why in verse Three, verse 2 of the third chapter. But by whom may the day of his coming be faced and, and who may keep his place when he is seen? For he is like a metal tester's fire and a cleaner soap. He, verse 3 says, he will take his seat, testing. And, and I'm sorry, I, I'll clarify for everyone. I'm reading this from the basic English version, for more clarity. He will take his seat testing and cleaning the sons of Levi. 
If you don't know who the sons of Levi were, they were the priests. So the problem that was going on in Israel didn't start with the people. It started with the priests. See, oftentimes we want to make it a people problem as as men and women of God who want to beat the people over the head. But if we're not living right, how will they be living right? So Malachi was telling the priest, yo, it's going to start with you. The Lord, when he comes back, this thing is starting at the top. Ain't no pastors going to be spared. Ain't no first ladies going to be overlooked. No bishops, no apostles, no no doctors, lawyers, preachers, teachers, whatever you want to call, whatever title you want to use, God is coming for you. Will you be ready for his return? Said a refiner's fire. It says metal. Basically, when we talk about it, when gold and metal and things, the impurities, the hotter the fire, it burns off the impurities. Gold is basically coal. It can gold is not shiny. <laughs> gold is not shiny by default. It's not nice and glittery and clean by default. If you found a gold nugget in the ground, it would be dirty, grimy. It would look nothing like a nice gold chain. The fire refines it and purifies it. So it says he will take his seat, testing and cleaning. Testing and cleaning. Meaning he's going to find out what you've been doing. He's coming back. He's coming back. When I look around our world today, I look at the people and I and and, and my spirit is vexed. And I would like to be able to say that it's vexed because of the worldly people. I would like to be able to say that. Oh, if everybody could just get saved, get in the church, do what they're supposed to be doing, that's what the problem is. But what's vexing my spirit, which is the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, what is being vexed is is not the people who do not profess to know him, but it's the so-called church that... It is astonishing how we are truly helping to lead people away from Christ instead of to Christ. For the word of God said that we are of this world, of in this world, but we're not of this world. The amazing thing that I see happening with Christians today is that they want to look just like the world. They want to portray a worldly persona. They want to dress like the world. They want to speak like the world. They want to act like the rest of the people in the world. On the level that says, how can you be set apart if you're just like everybody else. How can I be different if I'm just like everybody else? It is interesting that the Lord posed the question. He he asked me to pose a question and, and, and kind of a rhetorical question, maybe not so rhetorical. But is similar to a parable in a sense. Because what if I said to you that I would give you $10 million right now, but there are some stipulations. You can't change anything about your life. You can't buy a new house. You can't buy a new car. You can't buy new clothes. You can't quit your job. 
You can't even take a vacation to the Bahamas or anywhere else. But you can use the money to continually live the way you're living right now. That sounds crazy, don't it? Like, well, wait a minute. So, yeah, I could pay my bill. I can't. I, wait, you're going to give me the money, but I can't do anything. I'm going to live the same way anybody would say. That's, that, that is a proposition that is just absurd. Why would, what would be the point? What's the point of having the money if I can't change anything? We'll be having $10 million while I'm living in the same house, paying the same bills, can't upgrade, done, can't do nothing. That, that, that's insane. So why are you doing that as Christians? You say you're a new creature in Christ, but yet you still want to hang out at the same places. You still want to do the same things, but yet you've been given an abundant life but you're still living the same way you were living before Jesus came into it. See, God will show you things in the simplest forms that he's given you more than money, but yet your life still look, it looks exactly the same way it did the day he came into it. How is that possible? Why would that be possible? This is as simple as I can put this. If you were clubbing and partying and hanging out and coming to church every blue moon and doing all manner of things before you got into Christ, if you're still clubbing, hanging out, and doing all manner of things now, what does that say? The word says that Satan is the great deceiver. Meaning, God has given you $10 million and you've chosen not to buy a new house, not to buy a new car, not to buy new clothes, not to change the way you live in, still being depressed, down and out, beaten, burdened, heavily laden, walking around here complaining, and then saying... The world, everybody just seemed to be getting ahead. Everybody. He said, if you take a candle and hide it under a bushel, nobody will see the light. If I really think I'm a new creature, which we love to quote, but I look exactly like I used to look, I sound exactly like I used to sound, I'm living the way I used to live, what's new? What's new? I see people, when I talk about being vexed, you look at Facebook, you see people who professing to be Christians. And the strange thing is, my wife and I had these conversations that we got people professing to be Christians who live in the exact same way we were living before we were saved. You, how, I mean, what you're telling me is that when I was in the world living in the old kind of way, I was saved? How is that possible? How can you even start to comprehend finding yourself in such a situation? And it's funny because you would like to believe that God may be shocked by this. He may be astonished. He may be lost or dismayed. But it's interesting because if you look at Matthew, the 24th chapter, starting at... Well, I'll give the introduction at the third verse. And it says, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the signs of thy coming and of the end of the world? Said, as I said, will you be ready when he returns? It says, and Jesus answered them, saying unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Wait. Take heed that no man deceives me. For many shall come in my name. Preachers. 
I don't care if you call yourself an apostle. I don't care if you call yourself a bishop. I don't care what you call yourself. That does not guarantee that you're a man of God. That's why he prefaced this. The first thing that he said was, take heed that no man deceive you. And then he tells you what he's talking about. He say, for many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and I shall deceive. For, for many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars. Hmm. And rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. How are we responding to what's going on over in Ukraine? We seem very troubled. We seem all on edge. But he already said there will be wars and rumors of world wars. But be not troubled. For all these things, get this, must, must come to pass. But wait, the end is not yet. See, it's kind of amazing that when the pandemic hit, all of a sudden all the end time saints came out. This was it. These are truly the signs. This is it. This is it. This is it. Now, the Ukraine situation, this is it. Let me give you a quick history lesson. World War I happened in 1914. So-called war to end all wars. Worst war the world had ever seen. The Spanish flu hit in 1918. The only pandemic you can compare to what just happened. So how many people do you think was running around at that point declaring that this was it? The interesting thing is we want to make declarations based on things that God already told us was going to happen. For nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, there shall be famine, pestilence, earthquakes in diverse places. Oh, we've seen all of these things. So it would make sense for you to run around saying, hey, get prepared, get ready. All these things are going to be the beginning of sorrows. Not the end. Not the guarantee that it was time but the beginning of sorrows. So, I'm Nostradamus. I see the pandemic and it's the worst thing we've ever seen, blah, blah. Yeah, our lifetimes and most of the people that were still alive because the Spanish flu it had been all, it's been over 100 years. So there wasn't, <laughs> Maybe somewhere, I think I read there was one person that was alive still, that was alive when the Spanish flu hit. And if they still got all their mental faculties together, I'd be utterly amazed. But we rush to do something based on our perception, based on where we are at this moment. But the interesting thing is, is let, let me read, let me read the rest of this. We're, we're going, I, I just said, then shall they deliver you up to afflict to the to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Why would anything that is happening in the world today, shock a Christian. Why should you be running around like a chicken with your head cut off? Oh, this is it, this is it, this is it. When he already told you what was coming, it's not about you worrying and fretting about what's coming. 
goes back to what I opened this up by saying. Will you be ready when he returns? It does not matter what's going on in Ukraine if I'm not living right. It doesn't matter who in the White House if I'm not living right. It doesn't matter whose church I go to if I'm not living right. Christ said clearly when he returns, first of all, he's going to start with those people professing to be his, head, his heads, his shepherds, his leaders, those in authority. This ain't going to be refined. They're going to be clean. What are you saying? We're going to find out if you're living like you say you're living or if you've tweaked things just a little bit. See, most people don't truly understand what the problem was during Malachi's time, but the problem during Malachi's time was the very problem that Jesus came into. The Pharisees and Sadducees were your spiritual heads. They were your religious leaders. They had tweaked the word. Basically, they had taken what was here, and oh, we had done adjusted it till they were probably about here. See, they had, they had made adjustments to the word of God. They had made it fit what they desired, what they perceived to be what would be righteous, not what God said what would be righteous. And then shall many be offended and shall be betrayed one another and shall hate one another. Verse 11 says, and many false prophets, many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. Why? And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax, wax cold. Why is it? That when we see a so-called man or woman of God fall from grace, we automatically assume that the people who had followed them were just blind. Because in some instances they were just blind. Because it said false prophets shall rise. Let me make it plain and simple. Just because you have a building with a cross on it and a name does not actually mean you're serving God. Not our God. Not Yahweh, not Jehovah, not Jesus. Just because you buy a building, put a cross on it, give it a name, that's not what makes it a house of God. In today's world, as much as any time in the history of mankind, anybody can become ordained. If you're willing to pay the money, you can go online, get ordained, and open your church. Me and Brother Robert, we're going to open the church of the brothers. We're going to pop up and, and, and look, here we're going to pop up today. I'm going to be the bishop. He's going to be the pastor. It's two of us. But we're a bishop and a pastor. We ain't got no other members. The reason, the reason these people shall be deceived is because, as he says in, in other passages of scripture, we got itching ears. Hearing, see, here's what, here's what we want to hear. We don't want to hear you shouldn't wear that, you shouldn't say that, you shouldn't do that. We want to hear you good with that, God don't mind. God, that's man telling you that you can't do that. That's man telling you that you, you're not this way. All people, all Christians cuss. All and you buy it, why? There's nothing wrong with a little wine for belly's sake. Why? Because you want to sin. 
So because you want the sin, you want leaders who basically tell you it's okay. I once explained that deception is not, I, I, I told a story about, see, I was, I was quite the hustler back in my day. And the one thing you learned about hustling, and this pertains to deception is, is that I can't convince Robert to buy a Hyundai Prius because unless he wants a Hyundai Prius. But I can convince him that my Honda Prius is that Ferrari he wants. And why can I convince him of that? Because that's what he wants. See, deception follows the line of not making you think you want something, but making you think what I have is what you want. So in, ess in essence, a great deceiver is a chameleon. He changes to look like what you want him to be. So people aren't being deceived because of smooth-talking individuals only. They want to be. They want to believe that I can be saved, sanctified, and set apart and still go to the club on Friday night. They want to believe me and the fellas can still sit around and drink brews and, and talk trash and holler at women because that's what they want to do. Women want to believe that walking around with their chests out and things so short and tight and see-through and clear that they want to believe that that's okay. So you're going to look for somebody to tell you that you can still get into heaven living the way you're living. So remember the $10 million statement I made that if you got $10 million, you are not going to stay the same as you are. And if I told you you was getting the $10 million and you couldn't change, you're not going to sit by and take it. But yet Christ then told you that you're a new creature, that $10 million doesn't even start to compare to the glory that shall come. But you're not living... Like your royalty, he said in his word that we're a royal priesthood, that we're the head and not the tail. But you still living like you never got the money, like you never was given the precious gift that God gave you. When they stretched them wide on the cross, he gave us something that had not been attainable prior to that day. And yet we're still living, making this plain and simple. God has made you a millionaire and you've chosen to live on the east side. You've chosen to still look the way you used to look, to still act the way you used to act. You know, they once said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. How many of us would be classified as insane? Because I know I'm not the only one that it done took me some time to realize that I was just going round and round and round and round. And I kept complaining and I kept belly aching. And you're like, well, what did you change? What do you mean? What did you change? What do you mean? Did you do something different this time than you did the last time? No. So... If I go to the same store every day, take the same route to that store every day, where am I what am I going to find at the end of that route every day? I'm not going to all of a sudden show up and it's a Meyer sitting there if it was a liquor store in the corner. I'm not going to show up one day and all of a sudden it's a mall there because it just appeared. If I take the same route to the same place, I'm going to get to the same destination every time. You don't need a GPS to find your way home. You know where your house is. Why is it that we don't accept the fact 
that it's not God who is causing us problems and who's binding us up, but the fact that we refuse to change and then we run from those who tell us we need to. I can't speak for 70 years ago, 140 years ago, 200 years ago, but I can speak on today's generations. And I have never seen more thin-skinned people in my life. You can't say anything to somebody about what they're doing without them losing it. We talk about constructive criticism, but the generations today have no idea what it means to take constructive criticism. I don't think they understand that constructive criticism means that I'm telling you something that can help you be a better person. That I'm helping you by, see, by saying, hey, I see that you're flawed in this area or that you made this mistake or that you did this a little wrong. So the next time, maybe you would say, well, you know, hmm, let me sit down. Let me, let me think about that. But today, if you tell somebody, I mean, <laughs> First of all, basically, you feel like you got to be packing a gun just to tell somebody, just to say, hey, excuse me, because they liable to cuss you out. I was talking to my wife. We were just talking today. You could be sitting behind somebody at the light, and the light turns green, and you being patient, and you notice they ain't moving. So you just toot the horn. All of a sudden, you get a harm coming out the window. If you end up next to them, they're looking at you like, like, what, all? Oh, I, I didn't lean on the horn. I didn't just blow the horn because you, you were sitting at the light. But we're dealing with a generation of people that don't want to accept responsibility for themselves. And we got a whole lot of people running around here, some of them so-called Christians, blaming God for their problems that they keep creating. As I just said, doing the same thing over and over again and accepting, expecting a different outcome is insanity. But you know what's scary? Is that we live in a world that keep doing the same thing over and over again and we keep expecting a different outcome. I told you World War I was supposed to be the war to end all wars. When can you tell, wait, first of all, here's the funny part. In most of our lifetimes, we've been at war with somebody in some fashion or form since Vietnam. You're like, when has there been a time? Because see, I can't go back past Vietnam because I'm not old enough to even remember Vietnam. So we have to start at Vietnam. But I'm quite sure when I look at history, right, you had World War I, the war to end all wars. Oh, World War II came up. Okay, World War II came up. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. The Korean War. Then there was Vietnam. We done been dropping in on Grenada. We been dropping Afghanistan. We done dealt with, with multiple desert storm moments. We, why? Because we keep doing the same things, Lord, I don't know where we going. We keep doing the same things over and over again and expecting a different outcome. It's funny, it's a quote that I always love because I'm somewhat the reason I ran off those wars because I'm somewhat of one of those history buff types, you know, I, I understand it because I always believe that first of all, you got to know your past. But a quote that I've often heard that says, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. I take you back to Malachi, where we started this at. He was telling the children of Israel, talking about the coming of the Lord, and this was before Christ showed up. 
he was talking about the forerunner, the things that he was talking about, that first half of what he was talking about, that was just talking about Christ's first arrival. But it sounds just like where we're headed right now, doesn't it? you like, he told the children of Israel, he forewarned them of what they were going to do. They did it anyway. They moved forward 2,000 plus years, and we're doing the same thing. So will you just call us all insane? You got to check that box and say, we are crazy. Because we keep doing the exact same thing, expecting a different result. God told us to trust in him, to follow him, to believe in him. And we do like this, kind of, sort of. I trust you a little bit. I believe in you a little bit. But then if you tell me to do something I don't want to do, now I'm looking for another opinion. And as soon as I find somebody that gives me that second opinion, I forget what God told me. The problem is, to make this plain and simple, if we keep living, <laughs> and I said, Lord, look, I'm a prophet. He can call me to do this in their times. You don't want to say things they tell you to say. This is a word from the Lord. We're going to make this clear point blank. <laughs> God said, to all of the so-called saints that if you keep living the way that you are living, you will not be ready when he returns. Amen. I'm done. If this program has been a blessing to you, why not be a blessing to it? Log on to experienceberea.org. In the top mid section of the website, click on online giving and follow the GiveLify instructions. Or on your mobile device, download the GiveLify app and search Berea Family Tabernacle of Faith to give your generous gift. Remember, little becomes much when you place it into the hands of God. Thank you for your generous gifts. It is our prayer that you've been blessed, encouraged, and uplifted by this broadcast. On behalf of our pastor, leader, and shepherd, Bishop Roselle Rutley and Dr. Dara Fila Rutley, may the rest of your days be the best of your days.